Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. A really, really, really big thank you to everybody who's commented on the first version of this presentation. It was rushed. I am getting very, very short on time. Saturday is looming. But I think it's worth me re-editing it, taking on board your comments, <laughs> getting rid of all the spelling mistakes. Thank you for those who pointed that out. It's very difficult to proofread your own stuff. It's much easier to proofread somebody else's. Um, anyway, this is take two, basically. It is a simplified version. And I'll admit some of the bits in it are the same and that might be a bit tedious to watch again. But the overall thing will have a slower, simpler feel to it, with a hell of a lot less words to try and read and listen at the same time. I should know better. I've been doing presentations for the last 30 years. Golden rule. Bullet points on the slides. Words come out of your mouth. Don't try and make people read and listen at the same time. So this is the more simplified version. And um, some bits are missing. I've just taken them out. Um, or, or abbreviated them to just a single slide. And um, others have been expanded. So uh, see what you think of this version. And um, I, I hope it's a lot better. I've taken on board everything that people have said, a lot of which was obvious when I watched it back. It pays when you're doing a video like this to watch it back. And you watch it back with coffee, not wine. <laughs> Mistake number one. Uh, anyway, this is take two. And I will take on board what a lot have said, that a YouTube version of this would be appreciated that can be left posted. And I'll get round to that when I have time. <clears throat> and if I end up doing this presentation on Saturday, I'll also take on board what happens in real life. Because I may want to make some changes as a consequence. But we'll see how we go. So this is take two. Thank you for that introduction. Um, this video is mainly geared to, uh, towards home growers, but um, I'm hoping everybody can get something from it. Please remember it's a video presentation, not a slideshow, so please, please keep your questions until the end, because stopping and starting is not going to be very easy. <laughs> so uh, buckle up, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, every orchid grower needs to start somewhere. Um, this is my story from where I started growing at college to where I am now. Totally certifiable. I'll be looking into a bit of history, some science and chemistry without getting too technical I hope, and the orchid types that are easily found, the sort of things we tend to have when we start out collecting orchids that are pretty easy to grow in the home, and we'll have a chat about caring for those types of orchids. So, uh, where did it all start? Well, for me, it started a long, long time ago when men walked in front of cars. <laughs> yeah, this is a long, long time ago. Seriously, though, <laughs> we all started somewhere, and I'm sure many of us started with this. A phalaenopsis, probably a white one in a white pot that was bought as a gift or a spur of the moment purchase and um, we brought it home and often what happened was this. Brown bread, basically. Um, but that's the point where you don't give up. That's the point where you put that down to, I must have had a bad one. And, and we have another thing about it and then one thing sort of leads to another and we end up with a few phalaenopsis. The orchid fairies start bringing them in when we're not looking. I'm sure that's what happens, because where there was a couple, then there's half a dozen. And um, eventually, if you don't seek help, all the windowsills in your house are going to look something like this. Your other half will move out, or call in a man in a white coat to get you certified. I think I've already been done, so I'm okay. But, you know, you can head down this road, this is where it can end up. Um, and basically, if you don't seek help, you know, you end up in this category. Crazy people don't know they are crazy. I know I'm crazy, therefore I'm not crazy. <laughs> you read what you like into that. And then you get a grow room. And this is where I am now, with 200 plus orchids, many, many species, and many, many genera. 
Um, I didn't seek help basically. I converted my conservatory into a grow room instead. And this is where I am now, where I've got a job to I've got a job to move in there, it's so full up. So enough with the jokes. Um, that was a bit of history about how I got where I am, and let's have a look at some science and chemistry. At the end of the day, orchids are just plants. They might be a bit special, but they still need water and food. So, how good is the water you use? Well, these two bits of kit should help you find out one way or the other. TDS meter tells you how much of stuff is in your water. It won't tell you what it is, but it'll tell you the strength of it. Well, this is good, especially if you're starting out with tap water that could already be a bit too strong, for some orchids anyway. And a little pH meter. Um, these come along with instructions and a swear guide because they are a bit of a faff. But if you get the one with the two buttons on the front, they are quite reliable. We, we go into what they get used for as we go along. So when you come to water, you've got choices. You've got tap water, turn the tap on, and there it is. It might be a bit cold to chuck straight on your orchids, but so be it. Rain water, if you look out the window, we get a bit of that in the UK. So you need to collect it, but uh, there's that. Reverse osmosis water, that's nice and pure, but you will need a gadget to produce it. And it does produce some waste water, which some people find a little offensive in today's sort of modern world where we try not to waste things. Distilled water is an option but it'll cost you money. Or you could have dirty polluted water and if you store your rainwater wrong that could be what you end up with. So take care how you store your rainwater. A reverse osmosis um, unit looks something like this. They're pretty basic but they need high pressure. The water comes in in the top right hand corner there into the first unit gets rid of sediment along the bottom up through the carbon filter and into the top of the actual membrane itself and out of the other end of that with the help of a flow restrictor comes your wastewater and your pure RO water. Um, this is very good water to start with for your orchids along with rainwater as long as the rainwater is looked after. Okay, on to food, nutrients and fertilizer. This is a controversial subject, controversial subject. Wherever you go, you'll get arguments. You can buy it in stores, some people make their own individual bits, and you might need some supplements. So let's go over the basics. Um, basics. Everybody knows about NPK, it's marked on in practically every fertilizer you get. Nitrogen, three main types, phosphorus and potassium. These are all mobile nu nu uh, nutrients, I'll come on to that, but plants need a fair bit of all three of these. Okay, nitrogen. Um, three main types, urea, and ammonium, and nitrate. The first two need nitrifying bacteria to turn them into something that the plant can readily use. Those bacteria form colonies in media, mainly in the soil. So depending on what you're growing in, there might not be many of these. They also multiply and do well when the temperatures are quite high. Yeah? So if it isn't, they don't do very well and they won't do their job. So um, it, it is quite important to think about the type of nitrogen. The nitrifying bacteria basically end up turning the urea and the ammonium. The bottom line is you end up with nitrate. So it's probably better to just get a fertilizer that's got nitrate in it. That way you don't have to worry about whether you've got organisms in your media or not. It'll just work. We've got secondary macro elements. Calcium, magnesium and sulfur. Now these are assumed to be in tap water in some form or another. Um, but it is an assumption. Um, Rainwater and RO water and the like will not have this this in it. And a lot of fertilizers you buy also haven't got this in it. So you might need to have a supplement, depending on your water. And then there's these micro elements. They're only there in tiny amounts, but they have to be there. All the things just don't work. Boron, chlorine, copper. I've highlighted iron because that's pretty important. It works with others. Manganese, molybdenum, silly word, nickel and zinc. And although they are tiny amounts, they do need to be there. So make sure your fertilizer's got those trace elements. So, totally confused? 
Well, if you use a well-balanced fertiliser, great. But you need to think about your water type. You know, if you're using tap water, then a lot of the fertilisers will be fine. But if you're using rainwater or RO water or something that's very pure, a lot of fertilisers on the market are missing those secondary elements, the calcium and the sulphur and the magnesium. And they do need to be there. So I use the MSU, Michigan State University formula, specially designed for RO water. So I don't worry about all this stuff. Right, back to these little gadgets then. Remember these? We had a look at these. So, we've talked about nutrients, but how much? Well, the TDS meter tells you, gives you a reading of what's in your water. It won't tell you what it is, but it'll tell you how strong. If you ask all the growers in this room, they will all give you a different answer. So, back to the controversy, and you're not going to get an answer from me. Some orchids will suffer with high levels of fertiliser. Some will take higher levels, but you always need to ask yourself, do they really need it? In the wild, they get a bit of stuff washed down the trees when it rains. And quite honestly, they don't get a lot of anything. And they do okay. <laughs> right, what about that little yellow one? pH meter. It's recommended that um, water is slightly acidic, somewhere between a pH of 5.5 and 6.5, and that is an arbitrary value, quite honestly. But different nutrients are absorbed better or worse at different pH levels. Some are absorbed better up the higher end at 6.5, and others are hardly absorbed at all. And yet down at the other end, the others are absorbed much better. Yeah? but some of the others start getting sort of um, shut down. So quite honestly, pH is important. Um, you always need to check your pH after you've added your fertilizer, because that's what the orchids are gonna get, not before, doesn't matter really. If it's way off, you need some sort of pH up or down. You can use a very diluted citric acid, that will take your pH down, and bicarbonate of soda will take it up. But boy, don't you, you need the tiniest of amounts. But swing that pH around. Right, mobility. The three biggies, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, they're mobile. The plant will move them around to the places it thinks it needs them most. Yeah? The non-mobile ones, they come in and they get dumped off where the plant thinks they're needed and that's where they stay. Yeah? This is quite important, especially when you're looking at the combination of calcium and iron. Calcium is the building block. It's what makes new structures, roots, leaves, bulbs, flower spikes, anything that grows, basically. So when you're thinking about deficiencies, the mobile nutri nutrients leave deficiencies in the older part because it'll move them. But your new growths will suffer if you haven't got enough of those non-mobile elements. Now that's quite a bit to take in, so I'll pause for some pretty blooms. After all, this is an orchid presentation. So uh, if some of that bogs you down a bit, don't worry too much about it. Some people love to know all that stuff. Some people just need a very basic piece of information and a lot of people just get a fertilizer and use it. And it's probably okay. It's not the end. I kept mine on tap water for years. They didn't die. They didn't do very well, but they didn't die. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at some of the orchids that are readily available. And by that, I mean you can get them in supermarkets, you can get them in DIY stores, garden centres, and some of the vendors at our shows actually sell mass-produced, bought-in orchids, not necessarily ones they've grown themselves. And that's the types I'm talking about today. So what's not included are your dirt orchids, terrestrials, hardy orchids, difficult species, but what is included is the orchids that with a bit of care can be grown in your home. The humble phalaenopsis hybrids, also known as orchid weeds, peasant orchids, phalaenopsis, and this quite honestly is absolutely outrageous. These are perfectly good orchids, nothing wrong with them. And there's some great species in amongst them which you, which you might want to try, but they're not so easy as those uh, mass-produced complex hybrids. Multitude of colors, quite easy to look after. Um, very, very tolerant of any abuse you want to hand out. They'll, they'll do pretty good in almost any environment. So it's an excellent place to start. And most of us did. So let's have a look at some. 
Some of mine, this is, of course. Sweet memory, this is a primary cross, so this is quite close to a species. Quite fragrant, and um, a bit more like the species shape. You notice it's not large and flat. They tend to be a bit like that. Um, this is green apples. It opens a lovely apple green. It does fade towards a yellow after time, but um, these are not huge blooms, but the plant I've got produces quite a few of them, so I'm, I'm quite happy with that. This is my favourite Phalaenopsis. It's got no ID, it's just a store-bought Phalaenopsis. The blooms are huge and the colours are gorgeous. I mean, just look at that lit up in the sunshine. Absolutely stunning. And I like this one a lot because I've done a lot of photography and, and this looks like it's backlit. With those very, very pale edges, it looks like the light's coming from behind even when it's not. <laughs> Smashing little orchid, that one. And I've got the mini version of that as well. There are mini Phalaenopsis with smaller leaves, smaller flowers, yes, but if you're short on space, you, you know, you can get three of them to one of the big ones with the floppy leaves. So, uh, yeah, it's another little mini fal again. Um, lovely yellow in the lip and white petals and sepals with that delicate marking, lovely touch, little flush of pink there. And this one, I think, was called Cute Tip. Uh, chick, but I, I lost the label <laughs> and it hasn't bloomed for a while so until it does I'm not even sure if I've still got this one but I bought it because I do like my yellows and oranges um, this is a very large greeny white one it's not pure white it's a greeny white and I quite like that for me it made it a little bit more attractive than the one that we most started with probably and that's just the large white loads of us started with that one I'm sure there's nothing wrong with it. These are good orchids. Right then, so I never look down on Phalaenopsis hybrids. I think they're great. I always put them on a higher shelf, then I can look up at them. Tee hee. <laughs> but seriously, there is nothing wrong with a collection of Phalaenopsis. They do well in the home. They're not difficult. They don't cause you stress. Right, let's have a look at the Oncidium Alliance and some of the intergenerics. Many are available and they are, the plants are from miniatures to absolute giants, but take care, in amongst these are some real fussy tykes that will cause you grief. Okay, with Oncidiums, if you have a coffee, the name will probably change. We've got Miltonias, Miltoniopsis, Brassias, Alicera, Bialara, Bugogiara, Cambria, Odonto, the, the list just goes on and on and on. <laughs> um, let's have a look at some of these then. Um, most of these I've still got. I think there's one or two that I may have sold on. But the variety of colours is absolutely endless and there's lots of good shapes. Tolumnias. If you've never come across these, look into them. Real miniature Oncidium types with pretty blooms, many shapes and colours, and these are not difficult given some circumstances. This is a biggie. This is a Rossioglossum Rawdon Jester. Massive blooms. Those are over four inches across. Um, a clown orchid, I think it was nicknamed once. This is Oncostelli Wildcat Cheetah. There's quite a few wildcats around, and a lot of them have got names like Cheetah and Bobcat and things like that. Lovely waxy blooms. Last a good amount of time. Oncidium Shari Baby. Everybody should have one. It absolutely fills your room with chocolate, vanilla chocolate fragrance and strong too. Well worth it. I think this is sweet sugar, but I'm not sure. Um, but this is your dancing lady, typical shape. You can see the arms sticking out and the big frilly skirt. That's endearingly known as a dancing lady. Um, I think this is Oncostelli Masai Red Splash. It's certainly not the pure Masai Red because of all the patterns on the lip. Um, lovely shaped blooms. Um, this is an old Odontoglossum hybrid. Um, as far as I know, it's not registered, but I just love these colours and these shapes. I've got quite a few of these. <laughs> and here's your uh, good old Nelly Isla. This one's quite a recent clone, Red Velvet. These are not easy. <laughs> there are reasons, but these are not as easy as a lot of the others. You take those home to die. If you want miniatures, go for the twinkles. There's quite a few different colours. Um, very, very fragrant and very floriferous. Loads and loads of tiny little fragrant blooms. This is a Miltonidium, uh, Melissa Briani. Very large blooms. 
Um, depth of colour is incredible on that. Really good bloom to have. There's another Twinkle. This is Twinkle Cinnamon. Again, very, very strong fragrance. Delicate little blooms in lovely autumn colours. That's one of my favourites. And so is this. Another Tolumnia Peach. Um, I got this at the RHS show and those blooms are absolutely gorgeous. The camera doesn't do them justice and lots of them too. This is a Miltonia Castania. Now this is apparently a natural hybrid between two species but you can buy it as a, as a, you know, a hybrid Miltonia. Don't come up often though. Miltoniopsis, more fussiness. These are not that easy to grow. Um, there are reasons. They like to stay a lot cooler than the others and they need air movement and they need humidity. Not always easy in the home. This is Odontoglossum Golden Rialto. I saw this and had to have it. Um, I know somebody else that's got one as well. But yeah, I just love those types. Um, this is a Miltonidium Peter Comp. Highly fragrant and quite a nice combination of colours. Medium to large size blooms and produces good spikes that plant. I've completely lost the name of this, but I think it was a Hawiara, something like that. But lovely, delicate blooms that are bright yellow. This one's common as muck. You'll find this one around a lot of the time. But the blooms are large, slightly fragrant, Miltonia Sunset. Unusual combination of colours there. Um, once we get on towards the brassias, the spidery nonsense, this one's quite easy to get hold of. Bretonia Shelob Tolkien spidery look to them and lovely colours. This is a true brassier, Chieftain Ludlow's um, primary cross. Um, these blooms are about eight inches from top to bottom. Very, very large. I don't need to say anything about that. How can you not want that colour in your collection? And what's it called? Cambria. That's it. That's all that was on the label. That's all I've got. And quite honestly, I don't care. I just love the blooms. <laughs> Right, let's have a look at some plants. They come in <coughs> all sizes, but they all have a similar shape to them. They've got, all got sort of egg-shaped pseudobulbs and a number of strappy leaves. Um, this is a brassier that I've actually got mounted. Um, there's a nice spike just pushing out of that one there. That's the big um, eight-inch bloom jobby that I showed earlier. Um, you can mount on sidiums, but not the best of ideas in the home. Um, because the roots will dry out very fast in your atmosphere. This is just to show big and small, basically. Um, you know, their sizes are quite dramatic. That's the Shelob Tolkien on the left, the Big E, and one of the little miniature Twinkles on the right. Similar look to them, but totally different size. Right, these are very rewarding. You've got all colours, shapes and sizes. Some are not as easy in the home. The Miltoniopsis and Nelly Isla are not so easy. They do like to stay cooler and anything with Odontoglossum in the mix is probably not going to be so easy. As far as light levels are you know, concerned, good to bright light but just remember in the UK we don't get a lot of that especially in the winter and even if the sun comes out it's only there for a couple of hours. Yeah, there are a few exceptions. The Miltoniopsis don't like it too bright so, uh, and Odontoglossums again. Quite honestly, most of these will do okay in the home range of temperatures. You know, somewhere between 17, 18 degrees C and 24 degrees C. They'll probably do fine, noting those exceptions I've already mentioned that would like to stay cooler than that. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, pots and media. The finer the root system, the smaller the media. Yeah, the more when you get up to the more chunkier roots, they can go in larger media. They all like some air around their roots. They don't like to be squashed in and packed in solid. They need air there. And quite a lot of these like to stay moist, you know, so something that holds some moisture as well. Watering and feeding. And this depends entirely on what the plant is doing. Is it in active growth? Because if it's not, if it's not pushing up new growth spikes or new roots, it's not doing much. And if it's not doing much, it doesn't need much water and it certainly doesn't need much food. So you need to adjust your watering and feeding. If this is chucking out new growth left, right and centre, water and feed well. You know, a bit of common sense there. Repotting. And this is going to wind you up. The books say in the spring. I say cobblers. <laughs> Some say when you see new growth. Qualified cobblers. I say when the orchid tells you. Pause for thought. Orchids don't talk. Yes, they do. 
They give you signs. And the best time to repot anything is when you see the new roots. Oncidiums have often only got a 9 or 10 month cycle, not annual. So they could be putting out new growths any time. But beware, not all of them push the roots out at the same time. So wait, basically. So when's the best time to repot these? When the orchid tells you? And it's when you see new roots, with the one exception. If the media's bad, then do it now, or you'll lose what few roots you've got. And we all know what that's like. OK, top tip. When they slow down, don't keep them soggy. Let them dry off in between waterings. Give them room to breathe. Right, dendrobiums. A lot of these are not suited to indoor culture, but we'll stick on a few that are. The nobly type hybrids, many, varied. The phalaenopsis type hybrids, given that name because of their shape, and the latoria types. They're not so easy to get though. So as before, let's have a look at some pretty blooms. These are some that I've got. Um, not too many in bloom at the moment, so not too many pictures. Spring Dream of Pollen, very popular and widely available. Lovely greeny yellow centre, pure white with that lovely little hint of pink on the tips of the petals and the lip. I love that one. It grows big though. This is a Latoria type, typical shape. This is Roy Tok Tokunaga White Knight. Um, these are easy to grow, but you don't come across them very often, and I still don't know why. They're good orchids. The Phalaenopsis type hybrids, quite easy to grow, and you can see why they're, they've got that name. Look at that bloom. It looks like a Phalaenopsis, except for the spike comes out of the top of the canes, or near the top. There's another Phalaenopsis type. The depth of colour on that is absolutely stunning, and the camera does not do that justice. I think that was called Polar Fire or something like that. This one has got a name. This is um, Thai Angel, another Phalaenopsis type. Lovely tessellated patterns on this one, which is why I got it. Um, it's not just a plain colour. If anybody's got this, Stardust Firebird, it says it's a nobly type. You dig down in there, there's only about 10% nobly in there. But nonetheless, it's a kiki machine if you own one of these. They produce kikis. My pride and joy, Dendrobium Prima Donna. That's just got a um, best hybrid in show at the Wessex show, which I was over the moon with. But it's a biggie. Boy, does that thing grow. Right, let's have a look at some of the plants. Then. There's no real typical shape to Dendrobiums because it's such a vast genera. They come in many shapes, really. But uh, we'll have a look at some of the ones that I've mentioned. This is a typical looking Latoria type. Skinny little bulbs at the base, getting fatter as they get up, with as they get taller, with a couple of leaves perched on the top. And the blooms come out near the top. Pattern on the back of the blooms often, as that pop-up showed. This is the Thai Angel. I'm starting to stick a ruler in here to give you an impression of size, yeah? That's a one foot or 30 centimetre ruler, yeah? So think about what you're buying. <laughs> this is a type of um, biggie and smallie. That's a kiki down there, Comet King, nobly type, and it's blooming on a kiki. They don't have to be giant plants to get to blooming size. And the other one is wedding bells. That's only just coming into bud. That's a late spring, early summer. And now just have a look at the size of Prima Donna. It's right off the top of me cloth. <laughs> it's a bit of a show off at the moment. But yeah, that's, that's over two foot tall, that plant. It wasn't when I got it, but it is now. Right, again, rewarding plants. Lots of colours. Lots of shapes and sizes. Most of those I've just mentioned should be okay in the home, but beware, some of them, especially the nobilies, can get pretty big and they'll take up your space pretty quickly. Right, let's have a look at some care then. Nobly types, light levels, good to bright light and the best light you can possibly give them in the winter. For these, that's important. It helps instigate the blooming, along with a couple of other points, which I'll get to when we get there. Right, temperatures. Most do okay in the home during the growing season, but you will need to try and cool these down in the winter. They effectively need the brightest light you can give them and cool them down, and you will get blooms. And that's the only extra little bit of effort you need to put in with these. Right. All dendrobiums, it's said, if they're not mounted, like to be snug in their pot, so don't overpot them and chuck them in giants. And if you're going <clears> to <throat> pot them up, get them into something that will dry quickly. 
because that will become important in the winter when you want to keep them quite dry. They'll need to dry quickly. And when they don't need to dry quickly, just keep chucking the water and feed in there. Um, when they're growing, I mean feed and water well. Just chuck it in there. Those canes have got to grow two foot tall in what short growing season we get. So autumn and winter and spring, cut that right down. Ease off with the feed until there's none left during the winter and a trickle of water to stop them desiccating. And then you start reintroducing that when they uh, come back into life in the spring. So a little bit fiddly, fiddly perhaps. Repotting, easy, when you see new roots. <laughs> and on the nobly types, that's usually accompanied by the new growths. One or the other will come first, but spring mainly, quite easy on those. Let's have a look at the other two. I'll put them together because they grow similar needs and similar care. Okay, light levels, good even light year round. These come from mainly evergreen forests, so they get an even light level. Not too strong, I don't need really high light, just a good even light. Temperatures, do not let these get cold. They don't like it. They come from tropical rainforests where it doesn't get that cold. So nice even temperatures because they are continuous growers. Try and get a difference between day and night though. Most orchids appreciate that. Pots and media. Again, dendrobiums like to be snug, but with these, because they're continuous growers, it pays to have something that holds the moisture better. Yeah? So I usually add some sphagnum moss in with my mix so that it just stays moist that little bit longer, holds it in there, and allows them to be what they are, continuous growers. Right, watering and feeding. These are supposed to be kept evenly moist when growing, but think about our winter time when the days are so short that just as they wake up, it's time to go to sleep again. They're not going to use that much water or feed during the winter, but they won't stop growing. They will tick over, so don't let them get totally dry for any length of time. Again, these are easy. Repot when you can see some new roots around. You know, that almost goes across the board now. But again, with these types, those roots usually come with the new growths. They usually go together. This is a vast genus, and a lot of these are not easy to grow in the home. But I'm hooked. At the last count, I had over 50 dendrobiums with a large amount of species. You can get up with the long cane ones, the anosmum types, um, Nesta coming into bloom on the left there, the purple one. There's a um, primulinum out there, there's a findlayanum, I've got hercoglossum, blah, blah, blah. The list goes on and on. I'm totally hooked. And look at that. I mean, come on. <laughs> that colour combination and those blooms are stunning. And that's the first time I've seen them. That's its first blooming this year. And my pride and joy, dendrobium. Jenkins CI. Before that had one spike with two blooms and now look at it. If you want to know how to winter rest these types, ask me. <laughs> right, let's have a look at the Catlier Alliance. Many of these will do great in the home and some of these have some of the largest blooms there are. You can get real big ones in amongst this lot. If you like that sort of thing, maybe these are for you. <coughs> Okay, we'll have a look at some pretty blooms, um, most of which have got names, but not all. There's an awful lot of just hybrids in here. This was a lovely little one that I sold on a long time ago, Catlia Little Mermaid. Beautiful, basic Catlia style blooms, but a lovely colour, lit up in the sunshine there. I wish I had a name for this. This is close to a species. These blooms are nearly six inches from top to bottom. They are big, and I love it. I'll be pleased to see them again one day. This was SLC Red Star. I haven't got this anymore. This one I actually lost. You know, we all have some failures, and unfortunately that was one of them. Pity. I love it. <laughs> um, this is Catlier Angel Heart. I actually got that from a Wessex member. Bloomed for me not that long ago quite well. Typical Catlier shape, this one. Nice combination of colours. I like my oranges. This one's got a name eight foot long. Catlia, Little Sun, Young Min, Golden Boy. I'm not kidding, the tag needs to be eight foot long to get that lot on there. <laughs> Some of the names do get silly. Whereas this one's got no name. But I don't mind. Look at the bloom. Highly fragrant, this one. It smells of freesias. Reminds me of my childhood. But, yeah, 
Big blooms, fragrant, don't last bad either. This is an unnamed hybrid again. You get in a pattern with these oranges. <laughs> Do like my oranges. Nice shape, nice frilly lip, nice bold colour. Good one, that. Now, this one has got a name. This is Young Min Orange. And um, this produces a lot of blooms per spike. And if you get it going, a lot of growths with a lot of spikes. This is a good one, if you can get hold of that. Right, let's have a look at some of the plants. Now, in amongst these are some biggies, and some say they look scruffy. Well, they look like cat leers to me. I'm not having this scruffiness. <laughs> right, here's an, uh, a nice little hybrid that we've uh, had a look at the blooms. Um, there's your um, one foot rule there. So this, this would seem, you know, quite a large plant, but I've got some a lot bigger than that. This is a more typical size of the heading down towards the miniatures so you can accommodate these they'll find a bit of space where they can fit in and there are some true miniatures in it true miniatures in amongst them as well so right the um bloms or blooms can be short-lived they're all colors and sizes most will grow okay in the home but be warned a lot of them take almost a year to come around to blooming and they can be quite short-lived but they're quite spectacular Light levels for these, this is your best light you can give them. But don't go mad, they can still burn. Direct sun through glass in the summer can burn their leaves. And once they're burnt, they look horrible and you're stuck with them for years. So take care, don't go mad, but good light. Temperatures, your temperatures around the house will do fine for these. Some of them bloom better if they get a good difference between the night and the day temperatures. And some of them need that to induce the blooms, but most will do okay. Right, most pots are okay for these, but these, these can do pretty well in clay pots. They quite like that, but they need a lot of air around those roots. Yeah, that, that is important. You keep these roots soggy and they will rot. So plenty of air, big chunky bark, something like that. All right, water in the feeding. Again, what's the plant up to? Is it inactive growth? Well, feed and water it well then. But these need a wet dry cycle. So after you've absolutely soaked them, let them dry. Then do it again, let them dry. That's what I mean by a wet dry cycle. Keep them soggy and those roots will probably go down and they take a while to recover from that point as well. Right, repotting. I'm going to wind you all up again. Books say in spring. I say cobblers. Some say when you see new growth. Semi-cobblers. I say again when the orchid tells you. And catliers are funny things. Some produce their new roots after the growth has matured and bloomed. Some produce the new roots just before the new growths. Some produce the roots when the bulb is sort of halfway to maturity. So get to know your plant. Take notes. Find out when you expect the roots, and it'll help you time your repotting. Right, so the best time to repot, when the orchid tells you, and it's when you see new roots, or you know they're about to come. And if that media's bad, then do it now, same as before. Top tip, don't let the roots stay wet. Choose your media wi widely, and soggy roots will often end up dead, so get air in round those roots they'll love it there's loads of other orchid types but today in this talk i'm not going into the lots of them but people can grow vanders in the home patio pedalums there's, there's quite a lot of other genera that you could try but these are the ones i'm sticking to today keep it simple now i'll wind you up are orchids difficult to grow and the simple answer is no it's not the orchid that's difficult to grow but what is difficult is getting the environment right for them. That's our bit. It's not the orchid's fault that it comes from a strange environment, but it's up to us to get as close as we can. So the big issue, and not the one on the street, is the environmentals. Now in the UK, we've got to discuss seasons and their associated light levels. And we'll have a chat about air movement and humidity. And both of those are good, yeah? Right. So the orchids we're talking about are quite tolerant. Probably the Phalaenopsis are the most tolerant of being outside their comfort zone. But if you get it too far off, growing your orchids is going to be like uh, pushing water uphill with a rake. An impossible task. So bear these bits in mind. We live in the UK, not Florida. So what is shady? What is bright light? Yeah? We get short days with the sun low in the sky. 
There's no such thing as bright light when that's happening. In my grow room, all the shade netting comes off in the winter. Everything gets direct sun straight in through the glass. That's the brightest light I can give it. That's the lot. Every genera I've got, they all get that in the winter. Because that sun is weak. Next to nothing, you know. But come the summertime, that will get strong. Yeah? But when you read in books that Phalaenopsis like it shady, I'll tell you what, you give them more light and see how better they grow. And see how many more blooms you get on your spikes. Shady in the UK is almost dark. <clears throat> so just think about where they come from in the tropics with 11 to 13 hour day lengths constantly, year in, year out. The sun's right up in the sky and it's strong. So that's good light. Right, so in the winter, as I said, all my shade netting comes off. In the UK, in the winter, we do not get bright light. It's just not there. Yeah? So bear that in mind. If you're indoors, get your plants up near them windows. Give them as much light as you can. And if you need to create areas when the light's a little bit lower, then create a little light microclimate. Stand one plant behind another. You know, move it away from the glass, or even move it to a different room where it just gets early morning or late afternoon sun. There's ways of adjusting the light in the home. Yeah, Leaving them static in the same place might not be the best of ideas. So think about moving them around now and again to go with the seasons. Okay, and think about where your orchid comes from. Three types of forests, really. Evergreen forests. Well, the light never gets that strong, does it? It's leaves there. Deciduous forests. So that's going to get pretty bright in the winter when the leaves are gone. And the special one, montane forests. Cool, shrouded in mist and fog. Totally different atmosphere. And the ones we're talking about don't come from there. <laughs> right, air movement and humidity. This is the easiest thing to talk about, but it's often the hardest thing to deal with, especially in the home. You can't have your walls and curtains dripping wet and high humidity. But, you know, you can have a go at doing some way towards a slightly better environment. The ones we've talked about, none of them like hot, dry air. And quite honestly, they don't like cold, moist air. They would all appreciate a bit of air movement. So if you want to move the air, you need some fans. Multiple choices. Oscillating fans do great. The bigger, the less strong they are. I've got quite a few little 6-inch computer fans, 12-volt jobbies. They stay on 24-7. But bottom line really is try and get your air moving a bit. It will help your plants. Humidity, this is not easy in the home, and um, the first thing you need to really sort out is how humid is your air? Well, you can't stick your finger in, up in the air and find out. You need a gadget, basically. These are six quid on eBay, yeah? I've got three of these just dotted around. They tell you the temperature. You can adjust that to degree C and, and F. They tell you the humidity, and you even get a clock with them for six quid. So what is reasonable humidity? The fowls will put up with almost anything, they really will. Catley is like a little bit more, but are quite tolerant. For most of the oncidiums and the intergenerics, they do like a bit more humidity around. So we can have a go at raising the humidity. Humidity trays, you know. Um, if you're going to have humidity trays, get something in them, like pebbles or something, to spread the water around and give a higher evaporation rate. You can spray the orchids if you like, but I'm not too keen on that. Water lying around is not good. Or you can get a gadget. <laughs> I like my gadgets. Um, humidifiers, misters, foggers, whatever you want to call them. There are lots designed to go in the home. They look sort of like this. Um, the one I use is pretty powerful and holds a lot of water, but I've got a grow room. I can chuck water around and not worry about it. My curtains aren't going to go green in the grow room. But um, <sighs> foggers and humidifiers are pretty good, but there's a few things you need to bear in mind. They produce a cool mist and it falls. So to work really well around your orchid, you need a fan or you need to put them up high because that mist is going to fall down and it's cold. Don't get your orchids wet with the mist that comes out of those things. It's pretty cold. And you'll need to manually turn them on and off unless you automate them in some shape or form. Right, bugs, critters and diseases. Books say use this and that, and most of those items are long since banned and even illegal to own. So that's a lot of use. You can tell I'm not so keen on books, can't you? 
Right, you are likely to get aphids, mealybugs, spider mites and scale. Brrr. I've had them, probably still got them. Two choices really, the soapy wash type things that smother them and suffocate them, or you can use some sort of systemic chemi chemical control. And in the UK, we are incredibly limited down that road because we're not responsible adults and we're not allowed to have chemicals, especially ones that really, really work. <laughs> Right, other things, bugs, critters and diseases, viruses. This is the least common that you're liable to come, come across. Um, some are spread by spider mites and biting insects. Look around the room. The biggest spreader of viruses is you. Keep your cutting tools sterile. Yeah, it's people that spread these things more than anything. Common ones you're liable to come across, it's all in the name, mosaic, ring spot and orchid fleck virus. There is no cure for viruses. If in doubt, chuck it out, get yourself a flamethrower in the backyard. Don't take risks. Bacterial and fungal rots, these work fast. At the first signs of anything like this, cut it out. In worst cases, dump the plant, it can spread. Be vigilant. You can try your luck with systemic fungicides. The bad one, Fusarium wilt. I'd put money on the fact that a lot of you have got this and don't know it yet. It's a fungus, and in some cases can be stopped and plants can recover. I've seen this called a virus in some of the older books. Come on, get up to date. It's a fungus. It can be killed. Right, the symptoms for this. Slowing down in growth, lack of vigour, root tips stopping growth with tips just turning black or brown. The only sure way to tell is cut the rhizome, you'll see the purple ring of death. Well, I hope you never do. Right, feeling thoroughly depressed? Let's cheer things up a bit. Bugs can be dealt with, but act fast before it becomes an infestation. Watch out for any rots, cut it out, and as I said, the least likely is viruses. So in summing up, get to know your orchids. Keep a close eye on them. Always be on the lookout for the best place for each orchid. Move them around a bit and remember those microclimates. And most of all, enjoy your orchids. I'm going to leave you with a question. Are my orchids doing okay? If the answer is no, maybe something I've said will actually help you. If the answer is yes, then dwell on this. Could they be doing better? and hopefully there's a little tip or two as we went along our way. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your time. Um, it's been a pleasure. And um, now we can move on to the any questions. And I'll take a big breath and have a seat. Thanks for listening to me and uh, watching my presentation. Okay, that's take two. Quite a bit added, quite a few more pictures, got some plants in, quite a bit taken out or made a lot shorter and much more concise actual words on the screen. So I hope this version works a lot better. I'm not going to get time to do much to it now, so the chances are this is how it's going to go out. Um, I'll have done a couple of practice runs with what I say before I do this for real, so it should come out a little bit smoother. Um, you know, that was literally play the video and talk along with it for the first time. <laughs> it did catch me out a couple of times. I'd forgotten bits I'd changed. Anyway, um, comments again, appreciated. Not that I'll probably be able to do much about them. But again, if you spot some spelling mistakes, please tell me. And I'll make you look an idiot if you can't spell stuff. And I can't spell check a video. It, the tool isn't there. It's not a slideshow, as I've said. So... Uh, if you stuck till the end, thanks for watching, and I hope this is a, a considerably better version than uh, the first one. But let me know. See you next time.